Well, good afternoon. It's officially noon um, on Monday. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us um, for this next little bit of time um, for our stigma and substance use disorder webinar. Um, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, if you'll just make sure that you're muted, um, that would be wonderful. And if you have questions throughout the presentation, if you can enter them in the chat, that would be wonderful, or we will have time afterwards for a Q&A um, in which you may either use the raise your hand function or at that time, um, we'll ask folks to unmute um, that have questions. We will save the questions until the end, um, and then we'll have enough time, um, hopefully, for um, a nice Q&A. Um, also, you'll find some um, activity codes there on your screen. Please feel free to, um, to utilize those. I will share them throughout the presentation as well um, via a PDF in the chat, um, in the chat function. Um, and then I'll share it again um, at the end as well. Um, we'll, um, we'll let folks continue to trickle in, but we will go ahead and get started. Um, and before I introduce um, our speaker, um, I would love to share a little bit of information about the Michigan Opioid Collaborative and what we do here um, to help serve our communities around Michigan. Um, the Michigan Opioid Collaborative is a grant funded program aimed to increase the availability of MOUD treatment in Michigan, as well as bring awareness and education to all SUDs. MOC offers free same day consultation services to providers for any patient with a substance use disorder. The Michigan Opioid Collaborative offers quarterly introduction to BUP trainings, as well as webinars on a variety of educational topics, such as addiction, healthcare, substance use topics, and like today, stigma. We provide support for diagnosis, treatment planning, and medication management as well. We have a hepatologist on our team who offers um, hepatitis C treatment consultations within 48 hours. She also facilitates a biweekly case consultation webinar to review cases with other providers and has developed a three-part webinar series on HCV treatment. We have created many toolkits for, for providers to use as resources when treating patients with multiple SUDs, and you can find those on our website. Again, we sincerely um, appreciate your attendance today and hope you enjoy our presentation by Dr. Paul Trowbridge. Um, Dr. Trowbridge, I will turn it over to you and stop sharing. Um, and let you take on over. Fabulous, thank you. Uh, let me see, I have to share just my screen here. So give me one second. There we go. Can everyone see that and hear me? Yes. Fabulous. Uh, th thank you for coming today and I appreciate the time to talk to y'all. Um, I'll be introducing my Credentials as part of the presentation later on. For now, I'll say I'm an addictionologist who works at Trinity Health in Grand Rapids. I also work with the Michigan Opioid Collaborative and I'm part of the Michigan Health Endowment Fund grant to increase utilization of um, substance use uh, treatment in the inpatient hospitalization setting. Um, well, I'll try to get through everything quickly and promptly so we have time to talk at the end. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, objectives of this, uh, top uh, study is to um, state what the definition of stigma is, explain what the role uh, stigma plays for the stigmatizer, list the effects of stigma on people with sub, uh, substance use disorders, explain the effects of stigmatizing language against those who have substance use disorders, discredit common misconceptions about the basis of substance use disorders with evidence about how substance use disorders fit a chronic disease model, dispel common misconceptions about treatment of substance use disorders with evidence-based practice, explain additional barriers and stigmas in care for female minority and incarcerated patients and list ways to avoid stigma in our own lives. I'm primarily gonna be focusing on um, opioid use disorder um, as it kind of typifies the stigma for all other substance use, um, but it's certainly not the only place that people feel sub uh, stigma. And if I suddenly laugh, I apologize. My two and four year old are upstairs making very cute noises right now. And um, our walls are very thin. So I apologize if suddenly I smirk for no apparent reason. Uh, so what is stigma? Uh, Webster's Dictionary defines it as thus, negative feelings about people who, uh, negative feelings that people have about particular circumstances or characteristics that someone else may have. And I kid you not, this is literally the first definition I looked up at Google and built right in is 
stigma, social stigma of alcoholism. Um, so it kind of segues nicely into uh, the, the topic here. I previously worked with a clinician who, when dealing with patients exhibiting difficult behavior, would say, what is the function of the behavior? What role does it fill? Um, so what is the function of stigma? What does it provide for the stigmatizer? And for this, we look to the world of social psychology um, and the just world hypothesis or phenomenon. Um, in psychology, the just world phenomenon is a tendency to believe that the world is just and people get what they deserve. Um, because people want to believe that the world is fair, uh, they will look for ways to explain or rationalize injustice, often blaming the person who, in the situation who is actually the victim. Um, the just world phenomenon helps explain why people sometimes blame the victim for their misfortune, even in situations where people have no control over the events that befall them. So even when it's not logical, we will, we will look for ways to make the world make sense for us. And why do we do this? Um, it helps us not have to face our own vulnerabilities and minimizes our desires. If something random happened to someone else and they had no control over it, that random thing could happen to us and that would uh, frighten us. But if that person did something that we feel made them deserve that, that makes us feel a lot better. So we blame others for their situations to control our own fears, often at the expense of empathy, which leads to disinterest or even outright scorn of that individual. Um, people with substance use disorders face um, stigma from multiple sources. Uh, the medical literature is well, of course, largely based around stigma within the medical system. Uh, so much of the talk will have that bend to it because that's just where we have the most literature. Um, but clearly that is far from the only source of stigma. Um, all these other uh, uh, sources also play into how a person with a substance use disorder feels. And I will talk about them somewhat, probably least about self-stigma um, as the literature is least robust around this. Um, but we have clearly all witnessed indi uh, individuals with substance use disorder who have internalized the stigma um, from society and other sources. Um, and now it's their own stigma against themselves. Again, to kind of bring some history and background, um, to our discussion about uh, substance stigma and substance use disorders. I'm going to just discuss stigma with other conditions. This is largely from a medical perspective again, and in fact, it's probably going to be pretty obvious that I'm an infectious disease doc um, based on the examples that I'm going to give here, but I think they uh, demonstrate a lot of truisms and we can learn a lot about stigma and how it applies to SUD as well. Um, we have always had stigma around medical conditions. This is nothing new. Um, as far back in history um, as we can look back, we've we've always stigmatized conditions. We all know what it's like to treat someone like a leper um, because we've been physically removing people with afflictions like this from society for all of human history. Um, we've done this with epidemics that have come and gone like the bubonic plague, syphilis. Syphilis is interesting, one of the infectious disease that, uh, one of the few infectious diseases that likely started in the new world and then wrecked havoc on the old world instead of the other way around. And we've historically found ways to moralize these conditions, uh, put it on, um, blame on groups of, that are other. Um, syphilis, when it came to Europe, um, it was the French disease if you were Italian, or the Italian disease if you were French, or the Spanish disease if you were Dutch, or the Christian disease if you were an Ottoman Turk. Uh, we found a way to make it someone else's problem, not a thing of us, because then we'd have to acknowledge that we're just like those other people and it could happen to us. Uh, tuberculosis is a great example of this. Um, though anyone affected uh, anyone who lives in close quarters can be affected by this. It's frequently been blamed on minority groups. In the U.S., it's been waves of immigrants um, that have been blamed for these epidemics. The Irish, it's the Italians, um, or even as recently as currently, um, COVID. We, um, the Asian community, frequently bore on um, undeserved stigma, um, though they had very little, it's nothing to do about um, COVID. With HIV, uh, we had such stigma against the gay community in general and HIV patients in specific that people refused to touch these uh, human beings. Some of our elected officials even denied that it existed. Um, and even well-meaning people who were involved in uh, the investigation of this disease named it very stigmatizing things like gay-related immunodeficiency, GRID, as if a virus or a pathogen uh, knows a human sexual orientation when it infects them. Uh, such was the stigma around HIV that Princess Dinah seen here uh, made history um, just by being willing to shake hands with someone with HIV. And what does the stigma do? Again, what is the function of this behavior? It creates distance, sometimes physical, always emotional, from the humanity of the other person uh, with the affected condition. This is often protective. We don't want to be um, exposed to potential things that we could get from other people. We also don't want to feel too much for people we don't be, perceive ourselves as being able to help. It's a very effective way a way to avoid feeling sad about someone if you make that person uh, deserve what they've gotten. It maintains that just world. Um, people get what they deserve and deserve what they get. 
uh, we desire to maintain this justness for our own mental comfortableness. Um, if someone, anyone thinks we're above this, think of how often in recent years, uh, at least in the medical community, we've had conversations, if not uh, passing thoughts about, uh, you know, someone who doesn't get vaccinated deserving what they get. When an anti-vaccine radio host dies of COVID, in some ways we take comfort in the justice of this. No one deserves to die. Um, that's ridiculous, but it somehow feels just to us. And so it makes it something that wouldn't happen to us because they did something to deserve it. People deserve what they get and get what they deserve. And we have definitely done with this with addiction. Um, and here I'm going to go into a little bit of history um, to kind of put some context for later on. As far, uh, this is far from our first wave of addiction in this country. Post-Civil War, we had waves of morphinism starting and returning soldiers and spreading to the general population. This crested and began to fall, uh, but we again developed problems with opioids with our involvement in Southeast Asia when we acquired uh, the Philippines from Spain. We also began using a disturbingly large amount of cocoa-based products like Coca-Cola uh, near the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. Our problematic use of these substances in the early 19th century, uh, 1900s led to the creation of the Harrison Narcotic Tax Act, which had a lot of long reaching consequences and repercussions, including making the, those of us in the medical community the only legal purveyors of cocaine and opioid based products. And yes, we can remember that cocaine is a Schedule II medication. Uh, you can you can use it if you're a medical provider. I've had it used on myself as a child. My father, who's a physician, used cocaine with me. He put cocaine in my nose for bloody noses when I was a child. Um, and while it also made it specifically illegal for people in the medical profession to knowingly prescribe opioids for the maintenance of an opioid dependence, which is why we needed to create waiver systems in order to treat people. Uh, we created the methadone uh, clinic system. We created the buprenorphine or X waiver, which is no longer a thing. Um, but we, what were we wavering when that was a thing? Uh, the Harrison Act. And we'll talk more about this as it's much the reason that substance use treatment um, has been divorced from the rest of the medical system, leaving many in the medical profession to have received little or no education about this during their training. This also didn't arise during in a vacuum, but rather during a time um, when People in the United States were struggling a lot with alcohol problems, accumulating in prohibition between 1920 and 1933, um, with the 12-step model of substance use intervention emerging as the predominant model of care after this was repealed. Um, we've again had waves of drug use, heroin use in the 1960s and 70s with the Vietnam War, crack cocaine epidemic of 19, uh, the 1980s. And with all of these waves of substance problems, we found a way to make it a them issue. Cocaine and opium addiction early on were described by the American Medical Association, the AMA, as a problem with the African American population, though they didn't use such PC terms. Uh, much like the crack cocaine epidemic in the 1980s was later described, we found a way to make it a them issue. Asian opium, um, opium dens, African American or inner city crack problems, not an us problem. And we've done this even without uh, invoking race, though it's frequently been invoked. Um, we've created a group of dehumanizing terms that remove the humanity from humans with substance use problems. We call them drunks, we call them users, we call them junkies. Um, and we did this to make it a them issue. Uh, not only did we do this to make them the then issue, we also divorced the treatment of substance use disorders from science um, and came up with an alternative model uh, that has many, straight, uh, many strengths, but it's been difficult to scrutinize under the scientific lens. Uh, this model was created through the lens, uh, creates much of the lens through which we currently view substance use disorders within our society currently, um, often has uh, as an issue that's not like other uh, medical issues and therefore shouldn't be treated as such. Um, but fitting with our other stigmatization of substance use disorders as a, a them issues, it's something that should be treated as a, a moral condition. Um, an international study done, um, it's an older study, but I think it's quite relevant as it's across um, multiple continents and cultures. Um, it found that substance use, uh, drug addiction was the most stigmatized condition in the world. Um, and interestingly, this wasn't just the aggregate finding, this was the finding in every individual country it was studied in as well, beating out HIV as a more, uh, most stigmatized condition. Alcohol addiction was the number four addiction, um, number four most stigmatized condition. Speaking again from the medical perspective, as it points out many of the weaknesses of other perspectives, um, we often, uh, blame the person with disease, making them one with their disease process and in doing so diminishing their humanity. This protects the person who doesn't feel they have anything to offer um, to help that person. It's horrible, but it's true. Um, secondary trauma, bearing witness to off, awful things and feeling powerless to help is directly related to burnout. Um, as previously stated, 
um, the treatment of substance use disorders has been intentionally divorced from the rest of the medical community. We set up laws to remove uh, medical providers from the treatment of substance use disorders. We also set up, uh, it was well intended, but it removed the medical profession from the role of opioid prescribers for people with opioid use disorders. We also put very high walls of privacy around substance use disorders. Uh, 42 CFR is, uh, protects um, people in treatment for substance use disorders, even prior to the HIPAA. It's very well-intended privacy to avoid the, uh, the stigma associated with um, substance use disorders being out there in community, but it's also stigmatizing in its own way. Just like when we set up uh, that you have to uh, get separate consent in order to test for HIV, uh, it made it a separate medical issue that the regular medical provider felt uncomfortable uh, treating and unknowledgeable about. And so, so most of us in the medical community, we never really learned to treat um, substance use, people with substance use disorders beyond sending them to 12-step programs. So we felt helpless. So we protected ourselves by dehumanizing humans with substance use disorders. And here I'll finally introduce myself. Um, I went to the Wayne State School of Medicine in Detroit, Michigan. And as we know, Detroit is a notoriously sober city. So appropriately, I learned absolutely nothing about treating substance use disorders. I did my internal medicine training in Providence, Rhode Island, and wrote, uh, the East Coast has been drowning in heroin for 50 years. It's way ahead of the curve on the opiate problem. Um, appropriately, I learned nothing about treating substance use disorders. Uh, I did my infectious disease training in Boston, again, drowning in heroin for the last 50 years. Uh, part of that rot my rotations was going to the city hospital where people could be mandated to care for their injection drug related problems. And I learned that you could learn about treating substance use problems, but I didn't learn anything. Um, and then I finally did an addiction fellowship and learned about treating substance use disorders. So it's no longer wonder that we felt helpless with this patient population, even within the medical system where we have a lot of knowledge about what we should be doing, but we were never taught it. Um, this profession has tons of evidence about how to appropriately treat people with substance use disorders. We should be at the forefront of uh, this as a profession should put us have give us all the tools necessary to be at the forefront of helping people in society. But instead, even the medical profession with all this knowledge that we should have um, has largely remained in the paradigm of 12 step treatment. Now, some people are going to say, what does this have to do with me? I don't stigmatize people. Um, great. Uh, maybe that's true for you. I will say that I do and the vast majority of us do. And unfortunately, there's a wealth of literature around our perceptions about people with substance use disorders. Um, as previously stated, this is maybe the most stigmatized condition on the planet, and the medical profession, unfortunately, has done this well. Um, medical profession, uh, when you look at interactions with, between medical professionals and people with substance use disorders, uh, medical professionals tend to deal, uh, view their patients with substance use disorders as less important than their other patients and manipulative or even violent. They respond with less empathy, less involvement, less personalized care, and spending less time with those patients, even though you could argue that they're more complicated people and um, deserve more time. Um, and this actually worsens over time, um, worsens with exposure. Uh, medical residents are less stigmatizing towards patients with substance use disorders than our residents, who are less uh, stigmatizing that, uh, than attending, and the attendings get worse as they go along in time. And again, I think this is a function of not feeling that we have much to offer, even when that's not true. And so people protect themselves by keeping patients with substance use disorders at arm's length. What does this do um, to the patients? Well, we know um, patients are less likely to seek care if they have a substance use disorder. They're less likely to be retained in care, more likely to leave against medical advice, and they're less likely to remain in, in recovery if they're treated in a stigmatizing way. Um, so this is universally bad for, for patient and provider. Uh, medical profession is clearly not the only source of stigma for people with substance use disorders, though we frequently describe ourselves in the literature. Um, there's a little bit of medical narcissism there, perhaps. Um, people with substance use disorder identify multiple sources of stigma in their day-to-day -day life. Overall, whether we're well intended or not, our ideas of treating substance use disorders have become very distorted. We view it through very strange lenses. I think that viewing an everyday bread and butter condition in medicine um, through this lens help, helps illuminate how bizarre our treatment standards are for substance use disorder. It also helps to show where uh, patient, people uh, with substance use disorders are recipients of stigma. So let's say we treated diabetes the way we treat people with substance use disorders. 
if we treated people with diabetes the way we treat people with substance use disorders, diabetic would have negative stigma around, the term diabetic would have negative stigma around it, and medical professionals would treat people based, differently based on that language alone, which I will get into a little bit later on. When someone had a complication of their diabetes, they would be hesitant to come into care because of the, how the healthcare uh, system would treat them and how their friends and family would feel about the react to them needing care. Um, the treatment course would be more expensive because of this. Um, if you delay coming into care, it tends to make things worse and they'd be blamed for that. After the acute problem was stabilized, the hospital social worker would come by to discuss peer support groups for eating better. Many peer support groups would tell people to stop insulin because that's not real but diabetic control. A list of medical providers in the community who are willing to prescribe insulin may or may not be provided if those providers exist in the community. They would be discharged without insulin or a follow-up appointment for a provider to get insulin. If they found a provider, they would have to prove they're sick enough to deserve insulin, but not too sick to be in care. Um, they can't have diabetic complications or other health conditions because then they might not uh, may be perceived as too unhealthy to be in care. Their provider could easily decide at any time to discharge them from care if they had any other health conditions that weren't controlled, uh, their diabetic diabetes wasn't perfectly controlled, or they were witnessed to have eaten a cookie. Their insurance would demand uh, prior authorization at the end of the year to explain why they haven't gone off insulin yet and might cut them off regardless of what their provider attempted to do to stop that. Um, the state of Michigan did this to buprenorphine products when I first arrived here, um, back here uh, six years ago. Uh, their friends and family might pressure them to come off of insulin. They might choose to stop their own treatment because of these pressures. And if they are readmitted for their diabetic complications after all of this, the medical community would sit, sit around and wonder why these people keep coming back. That's insanity. That's, that's no one would accept this as medical care for any other medical condition, but this is all direct correlations with what we do with people with substance use disorders. Broadly speaking, um, this demonstrates a lot of different stigmas, but they can be probably broken down into stigmatizing it, stigmatization of language, stigmatization of the disease, and stigmatization of the treatment. So let's talk about stigmatizing language first. Um, this is the area of stigma and substance use disorder that we have the most literature. We know the language we use matters. Um, just labeling someone differently, um, as we discussed, as I pointed out briefly, makes it easy, easier for us to distance ourselves from their humanity. This is a very PC study. It doesn't actually look at the actual language that gets thrown around by people in the community. Uh, but even with this very sanitized study referring to people as a person with a substance use disorder versus a substance abuser, not junkie and not a fiend, not any of the far less uh, humanizing terms we use, just referring to them as a substance abuser rather than a person with a substance use disorder, makes us feel that they're more personally culpable and punitive measures should be taken, which is really interesting because I'm not sure when else in the field of medicine uh, punishment is something that is felt to be appropriate to deal out. In other words, um, just labeling someone as a, an abuser, they're perceived to be less likely to be benefit from treatment, more likely to benefit from punishment, more likely to be a social threat, more likely to be responsible for their own uh, situation and uh, they're perceived as being more in control of their substance use without any help. Um, when I was a medical student, I listened to providers in the emergency department laughing at someone who had just been um, revived with naloxone um, and who was angry and uncomfortable as you are when you're acute opioid withdrawal. Uh, you don't laugh at a person with a substance use disorder. You can laugh at a junkie. Um, the words we use matter. Here's another stu study that showed very similar things. Uh, just reading the conclusion, results provide more uh, further evidence that previously identified stigmatizing language has the uh, potential to influence the medical uh, care and provider uh, medical practitioners' perceptions of individuals with substance use disorders and should be avoided. Um, other commonly used words that we use with substance use disorders have commentations, even if we don't have studies directly uh, looking at these. Consider the idea of clean versus dirty. These are literally the definitions from Merriam-Webster dictionary. There are strong connotations of morality intertwined with these ideas of cleanliness that often reinforce the uh, patient's own experience of self-shame and self-stigma. And again, these with these studies, these are primarily based around the medical community. The medical community is a very sp small part of most people's lives. This doesn't account for inappropriate uh, stigmatizing language from friends and family day in and day out, or pre treatment programs that encourage people to self-identify as these labels. With the repetitive use of this sort of language, how could this not lead to self-stigmatization as well? 
not only um, is language use stigmatizing, but we've also stigmatized the disease. We talk about substance use disorders as a quote disease, but we don't treat it that way. There's a piece that makes the rounds every so often, and I don't know if it's the same story um, playing out again, or it's just the same story being reprinted. Um, either seems possible, but it goes like this. Um, two people are found dead of overdoses in the front seat of their car with their kids in the back seat. And it's kind of a moral outrage piece, right? You know, how could they let drugs do this to them? How could they not care about their kids? How could they blah, 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 all the things. And I'm not minimizing that's a horrible thing, but I get a very different thing from the, the, the story. Um, fast forward or rewind 15 years and see where we are. Um, for the sake of uh, talking about the kids in the back seat, let's go forward 15 years and see where they are. How are they gonna be doing in life? We now have kids in the back seat who probably received a genetic load uh, from both sides of the family. Uh, mom and dad had drug problems. They have genes involved now. They have early life trauma. They watched their parents die in the front seat of a car. Best case scenario now, they go to live with a relative who never asked for them. Maybe they go to foster care. Maybe they don't go any place at all. 15 years from now, what's the chances that they do something similar to their kids? And when they do, who's gonna remember that they are the kids in the back seat of the car when that happened? Rewind 15 years. What's the chances that the people that overdosed in the front seat of the car had a good childhood that didn't set them up for this as well? Um, I think it. we see a lot of things in this story that kind of show us how this actually is a disease process and isn't this moral issue, though that's not what most people get. We know that drug addiction is hereditary. We know it's trauma associated. We know that it's influenced by environmental and behavioral factors. It can be progressive. Um, it has biological and physiologic basis and can uh, remit and relapse in a response to appropriate treatment. Um, oops. Um, and let's think about it. We, we know the genetics of this. We know the mu opioid receptor that we inherit from our parents uh, often determines quite a bit about how opioids feel to us. My mom just barfs her guts out when she gets an opioid. Some people, it's an aha moment where that's how they want to feel forever. That's a genetic thing. That's not a moral flaw. Uh, we know that the GABA receptor you in inherit from your parents can uh, influence how you perceive the effects of alcohol. We know there's genes involved with the so-called Asian flush, right? In, South in Southeast Asia, there's a gene more common that when you drink, you tend to flush and not feel very well. It's highly associated with not developing alcohol problems because alcohol's not uh, drinking alcohol isn't pleasurable. There's kind of the opposite gene of that found more commonly in Northwestern Europeans where you can drink yourself into oblivion, never get sloppy, and then wake up feeling great the next day. That's highly associated with developing alcohol problems. We know that there's a lot of genes involved. Trauma is the name of the game. We know that uh, adverse childhood events are highly associated with developing substance problems later in life. We know that the environment that you're in is important. We, we talk about rat studies. Um, we talk about you know locking a rat in a cage with cocaine and food and seeing which which uh, lever it pushes to get what and if you do that the rat chooses cocaine. Well, yeah, that environment sucks. If you put a rat in an environment where there's rat things to do, um, running around tunnels, making nests, having sex, uh, it turns out the rat doesn't choose the cocaine any longer. The environment that you're in matters. It's not just a, a matter of uh, the drug being involved. And if we look at relapse rates as defined as needing higher levels of medical services, substance use disorders actually don't fare that badly against other chronic disease states. We just don't moralize those disease states. We don't talk about people with diabetes having relapsed because their hemoglobin A1C increased after the holidays. We don't, when, when someone with obesity gains weight after, we, we don't talk about them having fallen off the exercise wagon. By any measure we use, substance use disorders qualify as chronic diseases. We've just chosen to view them differently. And substance use disorders are one of the rare disease states where we not only stigmatize you if you have the disease, but also if you're on treatment for it. When we talk about uh, methadone or buprenorphine, we frequently conjure up images of people not doing so well, hanging out sleazy in front of the clinic, uh, coming into the hospital not doing well, you still using other substances. And what's wrong with this? Um, these are very biased samples. Methadone, I like to say, is one of the world's worst advertising systems. Who do we know that's on methadone or buprenorphine? People who aren't doing well. If they were doing well, we wouldn't be seeing them. We wouldn't know they were on uh, treatment. Um, if they're hanging out sleazy in front of the methadone clinic looking stoned, we know those people are on methadone. That, that, obviously, um, 
we don't see people who are doing well most of the time, and particularly within the medical profession, um, and particularly with methadone, methadone doesn't even show up on the state um, controlled substance monitoring program. So it's really hard to know when someone's doing well, if they show up once every two weeks, get their take home doses and go to work. You don't think about those people as being on methadone. They don't, that's not the image we call to mind and it biases our opinion of these medications. And these are cited reasons why medical provisors have stigma. Our exposure biases, and there's more than one. First, we do see sick people uh, that we know and, and we're often more likely to know that substances are being involved and we don't see people who are in recovery. Um, it's hard to see these medications as being useful when we only tend to see, see people who aren't doing well on them. But let's look at the data. And this could be a separate talk all by itself. Um, methadone, obviously the risk of relapse is uh, lower when you're on it. The mortality benefit is really what slaps you in the face from the data. And this is not, we studied 200,000 people with a new cardiovascular medication to see if there's any difference. We studied dozens of people and the results jump off the page and slap you. Um, there's, this is just one of many studies that has shown this exact same phenomenon when someone's on treatment. This basically dropped your mortality by a third, uh, two thirds rather. Um, depending on the study, it drops it between 50 and 75% uh, when you go on to treatment. And that's all comers. That's not, I'm doing great on methadone. That's, that's all comers. Um, I just chose this study because it has a nice looking graph that uh, looks well in a presentation. Higher doses also correlate with lower mortality. Uh, methadone is an independently risky opioid when used for analgesia in the medical community, but higher doses actually, if they stop you from injecting drugs, are directly associated with lower mortality. So if people freak out, they're like, oh my goodness, they're on 120 milligrams of methadone. Great, they're not injecting, they're more likely to live. Um, methadone lowers rates of disease transmission, including HIV, hepatitis C, and sexually transmitted infections. There's lower rates of criminality and reincarceration. There's better engagement in medical care and to boot, it's all cost effective. Buprenorphine has very similar data. These are essentially miracle medications. I'm unaware of any other medication in the realm of medicine, uh, medicine that nearly quarters mortality. If we had other medications like this, we'd be sued for not giving them. And so, yes, people need to justify being on these medications. And when you compare it to the other alternatives, medications work really, really well. I have nothing against any of these other treatment modalities. I will disagree with the slide on the outcomes of counseling because I will show you data later that there is uh, differences. Counseling can be effective. It's just uh, on a much longer time scale. Um, but buprenorphine and methadone are the only interventions for uh, opioid use disorder that have been proven to reduce overdose and death. Um, Naloxone is a great medication, but it hasn't been shown to decrease overdose. Going to inpatient detox and residential, that's great. Sometimes people need to do that to get their feet under them again, but it can actually lower your tolerance and uh, might be associated with higher uh, likelihood of overdose after leaving. Intensive outpatient behavior, behavior treatment, I send people there all the time because it's a great tool, but it doesn't lower mortality. Um, outpatient counseling, I think everyone should have a counselor. It's a confusing place to be in a human brain, um, but it hasn't been shown to decrease mortality. Met these, are, uh, these medications have been, um, and yet we have to justify being on them. And despite this overwhelming literature, uh, when you talk to medical providers, many providers still equate um, being on medications for opioid use disorder with as being the same as being on the illicit substances, and at times will refuse to give care to pa uh, patients on these medications. Um, other sources, unfortunately, stigma against medications is rife outside the medical community as well, um, particularly within 12-step groups. 12-step um, uh, group and peer um, public stigma uh, is, has been shown to decrease utilization of medications. The more 12-step oriented a person is, the less likely they are to, um, the more likely they are to view medications negatively. Um, and observe stigma within 12-step or peer support groups includes refusing people uh, to let people with medications speak at meetings, refusing to sponsor someone on medications, refusing to let people in, on medications claim recovery time. You know, you get your year token, your month token, your week token. Um, some groups will refuse to allow that if you're on medications and often encouraging people to um, shorten the treatment on medication. And the results of this is shame, anger, leaving groups, select participation, and sometimes people set, standing up for medications. I'd say another real outcome that wasn't mentioned in this particular paper is people going with it and getting off medications, um, which is 
uh, again, not great. Uh, again, these medications are the only things that have been associated with the decreased risk of overdose and death. And unfortunately, stigma against these medications goes all the way up to the national level levels among treatment providers. Um, I attended a 12-step discussion at a national meeting a few years back, and a man got on stage and suggested that opioid use disorder may be different than alcohol use disorder because of the higher risk of short-term morbidity and mortality and may warrant short-term use of medication. And people actually stood up and booed him and wouldn't let him speak any longer, not because he was inappropriately suggesting that uh, people should only be treated for a short time, uh, but because he was suggesting using medications at all. I have also, when I was in a detox facility in Boston as part of my fellowship, I heard some overheard some nurses at the detox facility talking. They're talking about someone who'd come through their program and who had later died of an overdose. And the nurse stated, well, at least he got off that methadone before he died. Um, think of how insane that is. Um, would we ever talk about this from an un this way about another medical condition, talking about, well, at least that diabetic who uh, came in and died of diabetic ketoacidosis got off their insulin first. That's that's insane. That coming off the medication was likely directly related to them dying. Um, we would not talk this way about other medical conditions. And these are people who are supposed to be treating. We're part of the treatment community. Um, and that's the sort of stigma we have against these medications. Uh, one of the first things, uh, question people, including patients, uh, want to know is how long does someone have to be on this medication? How long do they have to stay on it? State of Michigan, as I mentioned when I first moved uh, back here, uh, required yearly prior authorizations for buprenorphine products to justify why the person hasn't tapered off yet. Um, think about how crazy that is if we would treat people with diabetes this way, justifying why they still needed insulin. The goal should always be to come off medications that aren't needed. People with uh, diabetes should lose weight, should exercise more, should eat healthier, but we don't chastise them for failing to do this. We don't moralize the situation, make it shameful for them to be on medications. Uh, we're treating them to avoid morbidity and mortality associated with their disease state. Substance use disorder should be viewed in the same light. All the data suggests that longer term treatment is better. Um, and there's sort of higher morbidity and mortality when someone comes off treatment, particularly if someone is kicked out of treatment with methadone or buprenorphine, that massive mortality benefit uh, immediately reverses um, back to what it was before. Overall, we don't know how long someone needs to be in care, but there's no evidence for stopping medications with substance use disorder uh, for opioid use disorder. This is entirely a philosophical practice. It is not evidence-based. Um, you do know that the longer you're on care, the less likely you are to relapse after tapering. Um, so we have some evidence that at least one to two years show the great, uh, greater risk of long-term success. Overall, the risk of relapse decreases about 30% per year. Um, if you are on treatment with methadone or buprenorphine, which is compared to 9% per year decrease in relapse rate, if you're uh, not on these medications, um, forgive the tiny graph over here. If you look at the green line on top, that is the risk of uh, relapse, um, when you are on behavioral health alone. Um, so it starts out nearly five, uh, nearly 10 times higher um, than being on buprenorphine and methadone, and it declines more slowly. It declines by 9% per year. Buprenorphine and methadone in blue and red at the bottom there start out with a lower risk of relapse, and the decline is more rapid. It decreases by about 30% per year. Um, so again, we have great evidence that and this is also cost effective to boot. Um, so this is, we have no evidence to support the benefits of stopping medications for opioid use disorder. And we have great evidence that being on them longer makes it less likely for you to have a relapse. Overall, despite medicine's general support for evidence-based practices, patients on methadone still less medical providers as one of their prime sources of prejudice against them. Uh, despite overall uh, reporting that from people on methadone maintenance that health professionals were often perceived as honestly caring about them, there were many statements uh, in this particular article and others like it about uh, feeling they'd particularly been denied pain medications for things that other would have gotten opioid pain management for, or even, and here's a quote, as soon as I would say I'm on methadone, they would switch it up and treat me completely, completely differently. This was being said in the context of voluntarily bringing up the, uh, the information prior to being described, not an opioid, but an antibiotic. Um, so people feel that medical professionals view them very differently when they're on treatment. I'm gonna jump into a couple of um, specific special groups and then talk about what we can do 
to uh, limit the stigma from ourselves. So women in, in medic, uh, with substance use, women are, are often described as having a telescoping effect with substance uses, often developing problems later, but developing complications from their substance use disorders much quicker. At least 50% of women with substance use disorders have prior trauma or co-occurring mental health disorder. Uh, women are less likely to seek treatment for their substance use disorder than men, which is the exact opposite of what we see in medicine in general. Uh, women in general in medicine are more treatment seeking than men, the opposite of that is true in substance use care. Potential exp explanations involve, um, as mentioned, the higher rate of trauma and mental health disorders. Substance use treatment is often very male dominated. Men in general are more likely to develop substance use problems and therefore treatment is often very male dominated. Um, the single exception to this that I'm aware of is female physicians are more likely than their uh, male counterparts to develop a substance problem. That is the only group of women on the planet that I'm aware of, of that that is the case. Um, treatment tends to be a very male dominated thing. Uh, women are more likely to be in economically dependent or violent relationships that prevent them from engaging in care and may be more likely to have to navigate child care needs, um, prioritizing the care of their child over their own care, preventing them from getting into treatment. Uh, unfortunately, much of the female experience in substance use disorder is, has been boiled down to during pregnancy, as that's what most of the literature is. Um, stigma is rife in substance use disorder treatment during pregnancy. Um, substance use is often criminalized, decreasing the likelihood of seeking care for the substance use disorder or the pregnancy. Many states, including Michigan, when I moved here, and this may still be the case, um, I'm not sure, uh, many states mandate CPS reporting for all patients people who are on treatment for opioid use disorder, not that they're using anything illegal, that they were on treatment is enough to mandate CPS reporting, uh, which is bizarre. Um, women are often shamed for being on treatment because of the potential for neonatal opioid withdrawal or neonatal abstinence symptom, often by health professionals while they're hospitalized. Uh, inappropriate terms are frequently used like baby addiction. Baby is not addicted. Baby is not out there doing things they're ashamed of to get what they need. Baby may have physiologic dependence on opioids at birth. Um, and this is all crazy because the risk of, uh, of developing needle natal opioid withdrawal actually doesn't decrease if you stopped treatment because the risk of relapse is so high that the, they're uh, equally likely to develop neonatal opioid withdrawal. So it's shaming that makes no sense, um, but is unfortunately very prevalent. I actually uh, prompt my, um, have a discussion set out with my pregnant patients to um, directly discuss this before they go into the hospital because it's so common and so many people come back and say, a nurse said this, a doctor said this, someone said this about me well, um, and what I was doing to my child, even when they're doing the proper thing. Um, as mentioned before, historically, we've viewed substance use as a them problem and criminalized it. The current opioid epidemic and stimulant epidemic have often been viewed as rural white issues, though minorities are rapidly rising to near parity, unfortunately. Um, this has created a very uh, unequal response to substance use within society. On the one side, we have increasingly as society viewed substance use disorders as diseases um, as it started to affect the white population. However, um, this has not historically been the case uh, with, and a lot of historical inequities persist, um, including crack cocaine laws um, at the federal level. Um, Crack cocaine was seen as a form of cocaine more often used in the um, African-American community, whereas powdered cocaine was uh, seen to be more used in the Caucasian community in the 1980s. And laws um, at the federal level were put in place that criminalized, uh, that mandated use of mandatory minimum sentences for one hundredth the amount of crack cocaine as for powdered cocaine. Um, specifically targeting the African-American uh, African community. It's the same drug, just different form used in a different community associated with far different le legal ramifications. So we've tended to criminalize th things for um, non-Caucasian uh, people. There's also been unequal um, access to care. There's structural barriers to getting to care. Uh, when the data 2000 waiver was a thing, which again, it's no longer is, um, it was marketed to politicians as buprenorphine being suitable for quote, stable patients for the suburban youth, not your quote, typical methadone patient. Um, buprenorphine was also marketed lar largely to the private sector for those with commercial insurance. 
and buprenorphine uh, providers are less likely still to be located in counties with higher minority populations. Methadone clinics are often located in poor urban areas. The outcome is though there's often a preference um, described for buprenorphine treatment in minority communities, it's often not available. Um, the saying often goes, you graduate to Suboxone in the suburbs, um, and it's not available to everyone equally. This has also led to unequal experiences in care. Uh, the vast majority of people in the, the uh, workers in the addiction programs are white, um, so there's often implicit biases and a lack of cultural contextualization. Minority patients often describe feeling heightened stigma against treatment from their own communities as well, with the outcome being minority patients are often less likely to complete treatment programs or be retained in care. Um, and the incarcerated population. The Supreme Court ruled in the 1960s that addiction itself cannot be criminalized, um, as this would violate the Eighth Amendment, uh, citing that this would be like jailing the insane for their insanity was the quote. Um, substance use disorders, however, remain one of the most common reasons for incarceration. Um, substance use is, um, laws are also unequal, as we just discussed, and also unequally applied to minority populations. So people are more likely to be incarcerated for the same charge if they're a minority, um, and the charges are more likely to be brought to begin with on different charges because of how the laws have been written. We have the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Um, identifies an underutilization of treatment, uh, specifically medications within the criminal justice system. We have known for decades that the risk of relapse on release from incarceration is very high, and the risk of overdose is very high because it's after forced periods of abstinence when your tolerance is down. It's actually 12 times higher than uh, okay. the non incarcerated population. Um, treatment, we know, reduces overdose risk um, on release from incarceration. Um, We've known this for decades, but have been uh, okay with this um, happening until a lot of systems started changing only because of wrongful death lawsuits. Um, most states in the country still do not offer treatment in uh, incarcerated settings. Michigan has necessitated this for prisons and for jails, but many do not still have the logistics worked out. And though it's not directly involved in the incarcerated population, but with the uh, criminal justice system in general, Many in the criminal justice system uh, generally have their treatment options limited. I have personally had judges mandate uh, patients specifically cannot be on methadone or buprenorphine, stating that they have to be on naltrexone, which again has never been shown to decrease the risk of overdose. Um, please imagine a judge telling a doctor what diabetic regimen they are allowed to use. Again, stigma within the system. What can we do about this? Um, the language we use matters, and we can use different language. Use per person first language. A patient is a person with a substance use disorder, not a substance abuser. And if you don't know, that's okay. There's a lot of ingrained patterns that we have. We can do better. Try in a dictionary. Uh, there's many out there. Uh, this is a nice one. It's through um, Recovery Research Institute. I found it at recoveryanswers.org. Um, it's not the be all and end all of everything, but it's a reasonable resource for those seeking to speak in less stigmatizing ways. It can help you avoid stigmatizing words with things like stigma alerts here. Um, it can help with terms that we hear thrown around the office space and professional spaces and help us know if this is uh, a stigmatizing thing to use or not. It's less good about learning um, understanding street talk. So you're not gonna find things like speedball or riding the rails here, but you can use to let, uh, you can learn to use less stigmatizing language. We can also learn about stigma. Um, you're here, so thank you. You've learned something, I hope. Um, I've used this um, resource a whole lot in this presentation, and I have included the web address in my citations. Uh, here are the, the uh, contents covered within that, um, which I won't go through, but you can look through at your at your leisure. It's got some pretty heavy hitters in the field that wrote for this. It's a fabulous resource. Um, we can use evidence over our feelings. Uh, this is a chronic disease. There are evidence-based treatments. We should be using them. We can also empower ourselves. We are not helpless to uh, offer care on these issues. We can use evidence-based practices. We also need to recognize that the samples we see are often biases and we should seek out people in recovery to see the other side of the story. Um, I wanna leave on a positive note. I previously showed this slide knowing that healthcare workers are often a source of stigma against those with substance use disorders, but that was not the whole of the story in this article at all. There are also some quotes from this article 
um, including quotes from patients on methadone about their experience with healthcare. Um, many participants were quick to point out that interactions with healthcare workers lacked stigma and were characterized by warmth and understanding. Nurses seem to be the ones who are the most caring, accepting, and understanding someone's problems. We are not just the problem. We can actually be part of the solution and warm and wel be warm and welcoming mean as well. I'm going to leave with a story of hope. Um, the second patient I ever saw on an addiction consult service in the hospital, uh, Boston Medical Center, had just, we had just started up the inpatient addiction consult service. I saw one patient who did well, uh, but the second patient I ever saw um, really stuck with me. Uh, she was 23 years old, actively doing commercial sex work, HIV positive, hepatitis C positive, homeless, two kids, neither in her custody. She had come in about six weeks before the consult service had been up and running with a case of a heart valve infection and infective endocarditis. And as you do, she had left AM against medical advice. Uh, that she was capable of staggering back into care was testament only to that she was 23 years old and could handle that. Um, when she came back to care, we had the service up and running. We started her on buprenorphine. When I left Boston less than a year later, um, she was housed. Both of her kids were in her custody. Her HIV was treated, her hepatitis C was cured, and she was a manager at Starbucks. What else in medicine does that? We have a lot to offer. We do not have to hold people at arm's length. Um, we have um, we have a lot to offer people that we can make their lives better. We don't need to protect ourselves from patients by stigmatizing them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Trowbridge. We really appreciate your time and being here today. Um, we do have one um, quick question in the chat. Um, if there are other questions, please feel free to chat, type them in or, um, or you can use the raise hand um, function and we'll make sure we try to get to as many folks as we can here in the next few minutes. Um, so the question here is, um, can you compare and contrast the differences between the opioid academic and now the use of bup as a cure all. Um, that's fair. Um, I'm not quite sure the intended meaning of cure all in that. So if you want to um, want to uh, clarify that a little bit, that'd be fabulous. But I, I think I get the drift of things. Um, there is a large movement for medication first. Um, and I would say in a lot of places, what that practically plays out is medication only, um, which is an interesting transition and an intentional um, push away from the prior models of you have to engage in this many counseling sessions before you're allowed to see someone who could potentially prescribe you these things. It's an intent to push to get medication on board quickly so that people have that mortality benefit. And I think it's very well intended. Um, like I said, it has transitioned in some places to a little bit of um, medication only approach, which I personally don't like it when patients choose that as much. I, I think everyone deserves counseling. I, I think it's wonderful. It's a hard place to live in the human brain and it's a difficult to sort out things, particularly um, on day to day level and you throw in substances and it just gets all that much harder. That being said, we don't require um other things for people with any other medical condition. It'd be great if people with diabetes would, um, you know, be in seeing a dietitian regularly. We wouldn't withhold medication from them if they didn't. Um, I would like all diabetics to have access to a, a dietitian. That would be great. Um, but I wouldn't not give them insulin if they didn't choose to do that. Um, so I, there is a, a little bit of a push more towards just start the med, start the med, worry about the rest later. I think that's appropriate and a, um, push back against how things previously were. Again, it is a little bit frustrating because I don't think most medic, I don't think life problems are frequently solved with medication alone, but it's a understandable intent to try to lower people's mortality and give them options about whether or not they want to be involved in other things. Thank you. We have another comment. Um, I work in an emergency room and have started to gently ask patients and or family members if they would like a Narc Narcan kit that I see for substance use disorders. You are awesome, thank you. Um, another question, can you speak to the screening process of the form of bup that is appropriate for individuals? For example, I have a client in services now 
who has been abusing their Suboxone? Um, that can be hard and probably larger than the scope of a Q&A at the end of this. Um, I, um, that, that's a long conversation with the patient to fi figure out what they're willing to do and what, they're, uh, what is appropriate for them. Um, I don't think there's any special magic to it beyond negotiating with the patient um, and, and meeting them where they are as best you can. Um, I, I don't have any magic on that one. I apologize. <laughs> I, I use a lot of injectable buprenorphine. Um, uh, it's, it comes with some nice perks, but it is not the be all and end all. If you're concerned about abuse or diversion or all that, you, it can partially address those. But I think those kind of concerns are the data suggests anyway, though they are still present in my mind, um, those are concerns are generally overblown for diversion and um, and misuse of the things we prescribe. Um, it is possible, but uh, all the data we have suggests that we think about it much more than it actually happens. Thank you. Um, next question, any recommendation on how to engage healthcare systems regarding MOUD, MOUD and stigma? As a person without a white coat, we often feel dismissed or unheard. That is very fair because um, the stigma is out there in the system and the system is more than um, more than just evidence basis, unfortunately. It's, it's the people who are in it and the dollars and cents and lots of other factors as well. Um, I believe the Michigan Opioid Collaborative um, helps do that. That's one of the things we can help do is actually um, talk to systems, talk to people who are interested in making changes um, to, to deal with this sort of thing. So yes, you're talking to the right group right now. That is certainly correct. We have about four minutes left. I am going to go ahead and share um, the um, continuing ed information again here um, for everyone. Um, and if there are any last minute questions, um, feel free to um, unmute. Um, oh, we do have one more. Recommendations about where to start with conversations with the local court system and detention center? That is a notoriously hard one. I'm hopefully going to be giving a, um, a talk to the uh, Michigan, what is it? The Michigan Associations of Chiefs of Police. Um, engaging with the criminal justice system can be very daunting. There's a lot of entrenched views, unfortunately. Um, the route that I've seen work um, is finding peers who have um, in other counties who have had successful uh, changes um, and uh, getting their opinion rather than my, my opinion doesn't matter to a lot of uh, poli uh, police or uh, the criminal justice system. But if one of their peers has had a, a, a good experience with making a, a positive change, that can be a much more powerful thing. Um, and there is increasingly um, change happening in the criminal justice system. So those people are out there um, to, to provide that positive feedback to their peers. That's great. Um, there's been a few housekeeping questions. Um, the CEU um, QR code should be on the screen. Um, the PDF um, also will be um, has been sent in the chat. So if you want to scroll up a little bit, you might be able to find it there as well. Um, your local behavior health consultant will be reaching out to each of you um, with this PowerPoint presentation and with some other um, some other resources for everyone that's in attendance today. Um, so if you please just double check that you've signed into our chat with your name, your email, and your location, and we will make sure that you get um, you get these resources um, at the end of um, our presentation today. Um, one last um, thought there, um, Dr. Trowbridge, I'm not sure if you can see the chat or not. Um, I lead an action team through AA grant program, Substance Use Stigma and Response Project. Um, they have regional health system staff on our team. Um, they've distributed a healthcare provider stigma assessment, and they will continue, they will be conducting trainings to highlight this for anyone that might um, want to reach out to these folks as well. Um, 
We just thank you all for being here. It is just now turning to one o'clock. So we want to be conscious of your time. Um, I will be um, hanging out for a moment, tidying up some housekeeping things. Um, so feel free to um, continue um, reaching out with messages in the chat and we can forward those on to Dr. Trowbridge um, as they come in. Otherwise, we certainly appreciate your attendance and we hope to see you again at an MOC webinar. Thank you all. <laughs>